Good morning. I'm a beginner from class 12th. As part of my commerce project, I'm going to explore the power and potential of private organizations by analyzing the benefits and impact on society by three very different organizations and their leaders. Namely, Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, Musk, the founder of Tesla and SpaceX, and Professor Yunus, the founder of Grameen Bank. Even though each one of them made a tremendous impact on the world through their work, there are differences in the nature and the scope of the results they achieved. This assembly is an attempt to highlight the differences and connect it to the original vision. Original vision held by these three companies. Vision gives a sense of purpose and clarity to life and to business. Powerful br vision brings together ideas, people and other resources. By reflecting on the journey of these three men and their vision, we are trying to learn the art of framing the right vision at the very beginning. Beginning with Steve Jobs and Apple. Jobs was born in 1935, as were so many of the computer science geniuses like Bill Gates and Bill Joy. Bill Joy being the man who wrote the basic software for the internet. Notably, a different and very smart child, Jobs took an early interest in technology, engineering and design. Things that later helped him perfect his products. Shortly after dropping out of college, Jobs started Apple. He wanted to contribute to the world by making tools for the mind that advanced humankind. Jobs was a man with remarkable foresight. His vision at the time was to create beautiful personal computers far beyond the scope of the alternatives that were available then. Doing so required him to anticipate and understand the needs of the customer far, far ahead of his time. When asked about his vision for personal computers, Jobs talked about how personal computers were going to change the world. He painted a picture of how it would change everything from the way people worked, educated their children, and entertained themselves. Apple's success in, is due in large part to its obsessive focus on user experience. This approach has allowed Apple to build some of the most elegant and user-friendly products ever created. Jobs says, it's not about pop culture, it's not about fooling people, it's not about convincing people that they want something they don't. We figure out what we want. And I think we are pretty good at having the right discipline to think through whether a lot of other people are going to want it too. Apple's products drastically changed not only the way the products were perceived and used, but also the way the industry operated. Be it the Mac, iPhone, iPod, iTunes, Siri, all of them rev revolutionized their respective industries. For instance, if you take the case of iPhone, it had a drastic impact on many major industries. The first industry it appended was the PC market, was where Apple's stroke of genius was to put one in your pocket. As the iPhone and smartphone in general have become critical tools for information, the PC has become less important to many people. Today, people have many more options to make the connections they need to, regardless of location. The second industry that the iPhone impacted was the telecom companies. These companies were effectively, effectively forced out of the traditional voice business altogether. Try and find a payphone today. In contrast with millions of payphones that were in place a decade ago, today's telecom providers are data communication companies and have had added things like information and entertainment services to their basic service in order to remain in business. The iPhone also impacted the health industry. Today, one can use an iPhone to monitor various health metrics as well as access detailed health information connecting with the health professionals and even receiving health advice virtually anytime and anywhere. As can be seen from iPhone's examples, Apple's innovations not only altered the product and the industry, it also forced it comp its competitors to keep pace or disappear. It forced IBM to sell its PC division to Lenovo and forced Microsoft to constantly upgrade itself or copy Apple to stay in business. When Bill Gates first saw the iPod, he was taken aback and said, is the software only compatible with Apple products? To which the answer was yes. When iPad was released, it put many manufacturers such as Microsoft, WebOS way behind. Apple forced companies in the music, personal computers, tablet and smartphone industries to upgrade. By constantly improving upon itself and achieving customer delight, Apple has proven to be a shining example of capitalism. With its innovation and ability to provide utility to people, it has greatly benefited society. It is proof that with innovation and better quality products, a new play player can enter a market dominated by other companies. It also demonstrates that, com that competition would force competitors to innovate and keep up to date in order to survive. 
This is the self-correcting mechanism or, or invisible hand that Adam Smith wrote about. That markets would correct themselves via competition for the betterment of society. However, despite all its successes, it is not possible to ignore the fact that Apple's innovations did not extend to designing a product that reduced mankind's dependence on scarce resources. Though Apple did use some materials that are environmentally sustainable, solving the environmental crisis was not the primary objective of Apple. It primarily strove hard to deliver maximum customer satisfaction. However, creating such beautiful and extremely useful products has also created a dependence and a need for more such products among people. Furthermore, providing so many additional features and elegant design makes Apple's, pro uh, Apple's products costly to produce and buy. As a result, the products are on the high end and not within the reach of the poor. Owning an Apple product has now become a status symbol in India. And we could say that Apple has, in a way, contributed to widen the divide between the rich and the poor. Is this the result of having too narrow a goal? Apple forces us to ask the question, what is the role and responsibility of business? By only innovating and being technologically creative, has Apple fulfilled its responsibility towards society? Well, I leave that question open to the audience. Now let us take the example of another entrepreneur, Elon Musk. Musk was born and saw apartheid South Africa in 1971. He too was a notably different child and a nerd from the very start. He taught himself software programming and designed a game when he was just 12. He sold the game for $500. From the very start, there was a certain clarity in the way he acted. At 17, he left for Canada without having any relatives or security of education. He left because he knew it was his only way to achieve a better life. Ever since his college days, Musk had been thinking about the problems that mankind has to solve in order to survive. He identified these problems as sustainable consumption, sustainable energy, and space. All his companies focus on addressing serious issues faced by mankind, and his vision is to make humanity a civilization which is free from the risk of extinction. Musk said, I try and do useful things that work, makes people, make people's lives better, and make the future better. Though Elon Musk started many companies, today we would, we could, uh, we would only talk about a couple of them, namely, Tesla, which has an aim to make sustainable transportation a reality, SpaceX, which has the mission to colonize Mars and have access to its resources. Let's take a look at what these two companies have achieved. In 2003, when Tesla was founded, venturing into the field of electrical cars didn't seem like an alluring prospect. There were a few reasons for this. Firstly, it was deemed far too costly to make electrical cars, making it affordable only for a handful. Thus, the market was perceived to be very limited. Secondly, it was thought that electrical batteries and the performance of electrical cars would never uh, would not match up to the sustain, uh, standards of normal cars with the current prevailing technology. Due to this, nobody wanted to venture or invest into the, uh, in the making or development of electrical cars. However, Musk had a vision to make transport, uh, transportation sustainable. So he set about solving the practical problems. He drastically reduced the cost of these cars, making them affordable to a large audience and spent years into research and development which cost a lot of money. Now finally, Tesla is able to provide cars at a much cheaper rate. The Model Y and Cybertruck are bought by those in the middle income group. On the niche end, there are sports cars and luxury cars for the rich. These products appeal to the conscience of the consumer and at the same time give them the same features as its other non-sustainable alternatives. The success of Tesla has been so massive that it is now the most valued car maker in the US making all the com well-established companies extremely nervous and way behind in terms of technology. Coming to SpaceX, perhaps Musk's uh, most amb ambitious and audacious project. It aims at acquiring resources from the space and wants to make humanity a space-wearing species. Launched in 2002, SpaceX was perceived to be doomed for failure since it was thought that a space venture was too costly for an enterprise. Yet again, Musk proved common wisdom wrong. He reduced the cost uh, by vertical integration, making rockets reusable much like airplanes. A typical NASA rocket launch costs about $152 million, where, whereas Musk's Falcon 9 costs only $60 million. Just recently on August 3rd, two NASA scientists landed on Earth in a SpaceX rocket, heralding in a new age of private space missions. The company pl plans to send the first men to Mars in 2024, a decade ahead of NASA's plans. Musk has given the sector a much-needed boost in terms of technology and cost efficiency. 
Musk has so far invested in 18 ventures. Few of them have failed, but each one of them grappled with social objectives along with viability and profitability. Financial payment systems, sustainable energy, literacy, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, traffic congestion are all problems that Musk has devoted himself to. He has, been not, he has not been daunted by the scale of the prob- or the scope of the problem, but has seized them with both hands and jumped right in. There are many critics of him as there are admirers, but all of them have to marvel at his courage. The companies founded by Musk are sterling evidence of the fact that social problems can be converted into opportunities. It is also evidence of the fact that entrepreneurs for their own and society's benefit should not take the easy way out by choosing problems that are simple to address but venture into unexplored territories. Areas that are hitherto untouched by private enterprise and push the limits of risk taking. So, unlike Steve Jobs, who focused only on creativity, Musk has combined creativity with corporate social responsibility in his vision. But there appears to be a limitation to the kind of social problems that corporates can attempt to solve. The basic mandate of a company is to make profits. And there are many problems facing mankind that cannot be converted that can be converted into a prof- profitable opportunities like sustainable energy, affordable housing, etc. But there are others that cannot. By its very nature, poverty cannot be converted into a profitable venture. For this, the society generally relies on the government, but does it need to? The vision and achievements of Professor Muhammad Nurnes has proven that individuals can successfully tackle problems that are usually left to the government. After leaving his job as a professor of economics in the USA and returning to newly formed Bangladesh, Professor Yunus was shocked to see so much poverty and the plight of the famine of 1974 was unbearable to him. So he decided to help the poor in his own way, giving away clothes, food. While he was spending time with the poor, he witnessed the horrible consequences of loan shocking, which is the practice of lending loans at an unreasonably high rate of interest. He realized that loan shocking was the primary reason for the abject poverty in the country. He decided to meet the challenge of poverty head on. At first, he decided to provide the poor with his own money and offer himself as a guarantee to the banks. However, he soon realized that an operation of bigger scale was required. Hence, the Grameen Bank was set up in 1984. At the time, there were many difficulties faced by rural Bangladesh. Let me briefly discuss the enormity of the challenge faced by Grameen and the fundamental changes it had to bring about to succeed. Formal credit in developing countries uh, comes typically with high rates of interest and the case of Bangladesh was no different. Due to this high cost of borrowing, the public of rural Bangladesh was nervous about borrowing money. Also, banks typically have the backing of the law and insist on collateral as a condition to lend. Threat of legal action to enforce repayments scared the rural public away. Even if they did borrow, many times the borrowed money was put to inefficient use which resulted in the default on the part of the borrowers. Men borrowing the money would spend it on various recreational purposes, purposes in, rather than uplifting their household. In the informal financial sector, loan tracking is perhaps the most detrimental of activities. Money lenders would lend with exorbitant interest rates which would, instead of benefiting the poor and providing with, uh, them with wealth, would do the opposite. To further worsen the situation, natural disasters such as floods and earthquakes would severely damage the hard-won gains made by the poor, bringing them back to square one. Grameen realized that to overcome such problems, they would need to make organizational changes and fundamentally transform the thinking about banking. First of all, it made changes in the process of decision making to make it more inclusive and to build trust in the borrowers so that they felt confident in borrowing and repaying. Borrowers could become owners of the organization by giving a minimum fee. Borrowers could also become board members and participate in the weekly and monthly general meetings. This resulted in better decisions since the people themselves were solving their own problems. Also, since the organization is owned by them, it lends through lesser interest rates make and enables finance, uh, faster financial progress by the borrowers. Secondly, Grameen made fundamental changes in the operation, uh, operations of lending institutions. Instead of the threat of legal actions, Grameen used the concept of social liability. The workers are bunched up in groups of 5 to 10. In this system, the credibility of one borrower of the group depends on the repayment of loan by the other borrowers, hence creating an environment which has peer monitoring and social collateral. Thirdly, Grameen lends mostly to uh, women instead of men. This has two effects. It uplifts women since they have money in their hand 
and it puts money into more effective use because women as observed in the region uh, cared more about the upliftment of the household co- as compared to men it is incredible how with such simple techniques gramin has forced loan sharking to disappear and solve the problem that uh, sorry solve the problem that formal banks and lenders could not before gramin bank nobody thought that microfinance could ever work and eradication of poverty was the job of the government the prof- uh, poor could not access credit and were exploited by money lenders in 2006 gramin and Mo- mohammed yunus won the nobel peace prize and pledged to put poverty in museums to sum up gramin is a viable business model a model that has evolved organically to address the problem of poverty professor yunus has taken on the age old problem of poverty and lack of access to finance but has reinvented every process so that a viable large scale solution could be implemented at the core of the model is democratic ownership by way of co- cooperative structure it stands to reason that a corporate model with where the wealth is generated and distributed to its shareholders will obviously not be suitable to address the needs of a huge customer base whose main problem is poverty the only strength of gramin is its unity value has been created purely by bringing people together and organizing their activities in a productive manner while gramin is evidence of the fact that private enterprise can also tackle fundamental economic problems such as poverty it's also evidence of the limitation of the corporate model which inevitably leads to wealth accumulation and widening of the gap between the rich and the poor i wish to now bring my talk to a close by stating that the power of the individual and that of the private enterprise is tremendous one need not wait for the government to solve our problems be it technology sustainability or poverty individuals and group of individuals can solve the problems faced by society as a whole private organizations bestowed with creativity and innovation can come out with path breaking solutions however relying only on creativity seems to yield uh, limited results vision combined with crea- when combined with creativity has far reaching implications it appears that creativity without vision leads to misguided action and vision without creativity wastes valuable resources hence there are two aspects that are inherent to a good organization and its viability in the long run which of one of them is more important i would say vision therefore we should always ask an organization whether its vision aims at aims at fulfilling society's needs before asking whether it is creative enough to do so thank you